Thank you, Jesus. That was a tasty jam session here at yeah. River of Faith Preacher. Thank you, Lord. I'm so excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Continue yeah. our study on the book of Revelation. If you're joining with us online, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love you. Thank you for the support. And um, thank you for joining with us. I know Pastor Donnie has a word from the Lord for us on Revelation. Yeah. That's been super good, super, super impactful. And, and just it just fills you full of hope. It just charges you with hope to see how close the Lord is, how faithful he is. And just how faithful his word is that if he said it's going to happen it's going to happen and if that, I mean that's that's who he is he's the Lord and that's amazing and so I just have um, one quick announcement if you're watching this if you're with us you're, and you're leaving with us to go to the Signing Sound Theater we are leaving at 9.30 so I suggest just be here about 9.20 the bus needs to be rolling out the driveway about 9.30 we're going to eat some lunch at Golden Corral about noonish. And then uh, we need to check in to the Sight and Sound Theater at 2.30. It's going to put us back home around 8-ish. And so if you were looking in, uh, to do that, it's kind of a quick little rundown of how that's going to roll. And then um, I wanted to announce we do have an um, online option giving available for to do your tithes and offerings online. Um, and if you're watching this or maybe you're going to be here someday and you need help setting that up, you can meet me. Um, even directly after service. I mean, it takes three, five minutes to set up. I can walk you right through that. That's no problem at all. Um, but anyway, let's just get right into this. I know Pastor Donnie has a word, and um, I'm just excited to be here, to be with God's people. Amen. Yes, amen. And so if you need a miracle or you have a need in your life right now, just close your eyes. Everybody in this room, close your eyes. Just open up your heart to the Lord and just say, Jesus, you're amazing. You are the life. You are the way, you are the truth. There is no other way. There is no other life apart from you, Jesus. You are the only life, Jesus. You are the only way. There is no other way, Jesus. You are the way. You are the truth. And tonight, Lord, I just declare that your truth, your life, your love would begin to flow in every situation, in every organ that needs a touch, in every marriage that needs healing, in every mind that needs peace. God, I just thank you that you are the Lord and that you are able. And I just thank you that you're always ready. You're always willing. You stand waiting to fulfill and accomplish your word, God. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just tonight have your way in our hearts, in this service, and in your people. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Brother Charles, when you were talking, I just... I guess the Lord was just speaking to me, but I just remember times in my life that when I needed something from someone the most, it wasn't their words that changed me. It was their life, and it was them just taking my hand or putting their hand on my shoulder or encouraging me. Yes. And I'm just believing you were his hands and feet today. Realize maybe what you stopping to help right. did in that young man's life. Yes. So, I'm just going to believe that. I'm just going to believe Man. that whatever it was that God needed to use you for is what He used you for. So don't let the enemy steal that. Right. Jesus. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have access by faith in the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we are also we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in the hearts of by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For we were still without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I believe you had an appointment with a young man this morning. I have no idea. I just really feel that in my spirit. I just really feel like, Charles, when you showed up, God had something inside of you that that young man grew from. I just believe that. Yeah. I just believe that's what he just told me. And so that's heavy on me. And I'm not trying to make something up that, that we shouldn't share a testimony with we absolutely should. You're right. It matters what we say to people, but sometimes it matters just how we live our life around people. Right. And um, I'm just going to believe that for that young man today. Father, we thank you. You're all knowing. Thank you that my brother took his time to stop today. I ask you to give him peace. I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Whew. Listen, we're going to talk tonight out of Revelation 14, and it's going to be a heavy kind of night like this. It's already started that way, but it's going to stay that way. If we have a heart for the Lord, if we have a, lost, a heart for lost people, and we should. Amen? Yes. Michael, would you turn my mic down just a scotch? Maybe just a little bit. So if I get real excited, then I'll make it fall. I won't probably not be excited, but just in case. we got a lot of ground to cover tonight. From Revelation chapter 14. And I have 14 pages of notes. Come on, baby. So I'm going to have to ask for a little grace tonight. I'm going to have to ask for a little bit of uh, extra time. Are you all good with that? We're here. Extra 10 minutes, maybe, than what you're used to. I tried to condense it. But sort of separating it and doing it in two parts, it's the best I could do. It's good. His word's good. We're about two-thirds of the way through Revelation. It's been good. It's been good for me. I don't know about you guys, but it's been really good for me. It's challenged me to get dug into it and really just pull out of what God has in there. I've read it, I've read it, and I've read it, and I've never really understood it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure when I get done this time, I'll still say I really don't understand it. Um, however... He's brought some things to life in my life. He's, he's used it to use this time in my life uh, to draw me deeper into it. Amen? Amen? So I wish I was a really good reader because I'm going to read it in its entirety, Revelation 14, and then we're going to talk about it, okay? Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. 
And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of the harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Then all the ones who were not defiled, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on their forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Mm. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud set one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it in the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. I want us to begin to talk through this. It's a good, hard text. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. It's a hard one. Sometimes we don't want to talk about this kind of thing. Sometimes we just like to skip over this kind of scripture dealing with hell. It's exactly what this is dealing with, hell. Our resistance to talking about hell, though, may just prove why it's important for us to talk about it in the first place. It's not fun. It don't feel good. No. We all know people who need Jesus. Yeah. And without him, 
This is a reality for people that we love. Amen. <clears throat> Dang it. In Jesus' ministry, when he looked over the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it. He wept over it. He saw that the people of the city, he saw them as sheep with no shepherd, and it caused him to weep. I think we'd be wrong. Some would be wrong with us if we didn't feel that way when we read the scripture. Um, however, no one talked and taught more about hell than Jesus. That probably needs to be our model as we look at this scripture. We just need to keep our eyes on him and follow his example. Jesus must be our model. We need to talk and teach fearfully, and I'll just go ahead and say tearfully. When it comes to hell. We can't skip the hard parts. Going forward in our walk with him. We must teach his word. Completely. I think the church has watered down the word of God. And gotten away from talking about hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. Amen. I think. We forsake teaching about it. Because we've heard things like. Oh they just try to scare you into the gospel. Try, try to scare you into saying a prayer. Well no. The truth is there's a place called hell. The truth is, without Jesus, that's going to be reality for us. And people need to know that. We can't skip the hard part. We must teach the truth, but we should teach it with compassion. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Revelation 14, 20 verses long, and it's divided into a few sections. If you look in your Bible, at least in my Bible, verses 1 through 5, my Bible heading says, The Lamb and 144,000. But I want to rename it. I, I want to just call it, instead of that, I want to call it a contrast. Because it's a contrast. And then, verses 6 to 13, the proclamation of three angels. is what my Bible says, but I just want to call it a cry. And then, verses 14 to 20, reaping the earth's harvest and reaping the grapes of wrath. And I want to call that part a certainty. A certainty. So a contrast, a cry, and a certainty, and it all centers on the topic of hell. Y'all with me so far? Yeah. We're almost through two pages, praise God. <laughs> I want to reread a little bit. I want to just read the first five verses, the contrast part, and then we're going to talk about that. So it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4, then, I'm sorry, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found the receipt. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Here we see... Listen, I'm going to try to just stick to my notes. Y'all good? Here we see a portion of text that takes us back to last week. Pastor Josh already preached last week, chapter 13, and I'm not going to take a lot of time there, but I want to, I want to compare some things. I want to show this contrast. Here we see a group of people who were contrasted against those that we saw last week people that it's read about is standing in contrast to what Pastor Josh brought out last week in, verse, in chapter 13. Those who are worshipers of the beast are marked by the beast. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. It takes us back to last week where we saw Satan referred to as the dragon. He was working out his fury and deception through two beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Those who received the mark of the beast 
marked on their hand or their forehead. Now listen, they were marked on their hand or their, or their forehead, body parts that speak symbolically of one's thoughts and one's actions. Come on, right. But now in contrast, we see those who don't have the mark of the beast on their forehead, but here the lambs and his father's name. This isn't the lamb from chapter 13. It's referred to, remember, it referred to it as a lamb. This isn't the lamb. This isn't the same lamb. This is talking about the slain lamb. It's talking about here in chapter 14. It's talking about Jesus. This contrast that we see here in the beginning of this chapter is very important. <clears throat> it's very important. I want to remind us of a few things regarding those who worship the beast mm -hmm. and what they saw in the beast except itself specifically. So turn with me back just a little ways to verse 16 of Revelation 13. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads. Now back up a little further to verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All. All. Everybody. Everyone is marked by the beast with one exception. And we see that in verse 8 of 13. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Everybody is going to worship the beast unless their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what that scripture just said. Yep. So we have two groups and only, there's only two groups. It's not confusing. You're either you're going to worship the beast or you're going to worship the lamb. Hmm. Twist on if you're thinking up a little, didn't it? You're either going to worship the beast or you're going to worship the lamb. Those marked by the beast on their right hand and their forehead and those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life. But here's the problem. Here's Here's what confuses things a little is because chapter 14, verse 1, we read about 144,000, only 144,000 is listed. That number is listed there. There are, there are 144,000 that are marked by the Lamb and His Father. So what do we do with that? Well, I believe there's still just two groups. Those marked by the beast and those written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But now we're going to see 144,000 marked by the Lamb. Remember, for time's sake, I'm not going to take this back there, but do you remember back in chapter 7? Chapter 7 of Revelation, where John names 144,000, he heard 144,000, but he's seen a multitude that was in number in, mm -hmm. irnumberable. How do yeah. you say that word? Yeah. It wasn't. He wasn't able to number them. Yeah. And I think the same thing is happening here. I think it's just symbolic to the body of Christ. The 144,000, I think, is symbolic to the people who have been written in a Lamb's Book of Life. I'm just sticking to it. That's my story. And I believe you're either going to serve the beast, you're going to worship the beast, or you're going to worship the Lamb. Two groups. Two groups. Marked by the beast, marked by the lamb. Revelation 3.12 says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him my name, sorry, the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Now pay attention to that. That's going to come back around in a little while. We're going to talk about that. I will write on him 
the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So when you're his child, he's marked you. When you've accepted him as your Savior, he marked you. So again, to groups of people, I just want to, I don't want to beat it to death, I just want us to get that there's two groups, the beast group and God's group. So, the question now, if the first five verses were a contrast to Revelation 13, if this is a contrast of what the people of the beast look like, what do the people of God look like? It tells us. It tells us. What do the people of God look like? What can we learn about the people of God in these first five verses? First, they were in the presence of God and God was with them. Revelation 14, verse 2. The voice of many waters. And like the voice of loud thunder. Those things speak of his divine presence. The voice of many waters and the voice of loud thunder is speaking of his divine presence. He was with them. Also, the heart is always presented in the Bible as an instrument of joy. You ever read about the heart in the word? It's talking about joy. God's voice is a voice of joy. So the first thing we see about God's people is that God is with them. The second, they were singing a new song in verse 3. Huh. Yeah, I want you to. Go back to Revelation 5, verse number 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, say, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Revelation 15 verses 3 and 4 They sing the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the Lamb saying Great and marvelous are your works Lord God Almighty just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. You shall, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifest. The song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, we just read about that, the song of the redeemed. That's the song they're singing, a song of the redeemed. Remember in Exodus, sorry, you don't have to turn there. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but stay with me. You remember in Exodus when the Israelites had just come out of bondage and they walked across a dry ground. Come on. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. What's the first thing they did? They sang. They sang. According to Exodus 15, what do they sing? They sing the song of Moses. They sing the song of Moses. A redemption song. A song because they had been redeemed. A redemption song. It's the song of the Lamb. Because that enables our uh, redemption is the blood of the Lamb. So when we're singing of the song of the Lamb, we're singing about our redemption. 
when we're singing the song of Moses, we're singing about our redemption. We're singing because we are redeemed. I don't sing because I'm a good singer. I sing because I'm redeemed. Uh -huh. <coughs> Hallelujah. What enables our redemption? The blood of the Lamb. They were singing a new song before his throne. Amen. Amen. In verse 4, you'll see that they were faithful. They were righteous. Revelation 14, 4. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now listen, you can get really confused right here. Huh. Remember, Revelation is not always literal. Yeah. It's symbolic. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is trying to be degrading toward women. I mean, defiled with women. Wow, if you're a woman, that might be offensive. But I don't think it's trying to degrade you. I don't think it's coming at women and saying something's wrong with women. And I also don't think it's valuing virginity. I don't think that's what it's doing here. I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. It's depicting what being marked by Jesus looks like. Mm -hmm. Stay with me. One commentator that I read, his quote says this, Christians don't sleep around on Jesus, they're faithful. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Uh -huh. Verse 4 is talking about justice regarding spiritual adultery. It's talking about spiritual adultery. It's talking about I'm not having an affair on him. I am the bride. That's one husband. That's good. That's real good. It's not talking about being a virgin. Mm -hmm. It's talking about being set apart to him. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh-huh. Jeremiah 18, 13, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Ask now among the Gentiles, who has heard such things, the virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. Talking about the church, Israel. Talking about Israel, the virgin of Israel. They've done a very horrible thing. They had not been faithful to him. Listen. They followed their own plans. Almost always, you go study it out. I dug around in it some today. Probably not enough, but Almost always, when the nation of Israel committed idolatry, they done it often. But almost always, when they created idolatry, it was defined as adultery. 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 Yeah. Huh. Did you hear me? When they cheated. He marked it up as they cheated. Mm -hmm. He'll someday present his bride, mm -hmm. the church, mm -hmm. blameless, as a virgin. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. A virgin, faithful. What's the first thing that we participate in in the new heaven and the new earth? Marriage supper of the Lamb. A marriage supper of the Lamb. Because we're per we are presented blameless. Praise God. Also, we see in verse four, they follow the Lamb. They follow the Lamb. Those marked by the Lamb follow the Lamb. Mark eight, verse thirty-four. When he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is Christianity. That is a definition of who we are. Take up the cross and follow him. 
If you're a Christian, follow him. That's the definition of being a Christian. Amen? Also, at the very end of verse 4, they offer themselves as first fruits. This is sacrificial language, like in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It's, it's like the same language there. That we are, by the mercies of God, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Amen. Y'all with me? In verse 5, they reject what is false. They reject what is false. So we're talking about what this group looks like. If we're going to contrast it, if we're going to see what he's doing, let's see what he's doing. And it says that in verse 5, they reject what is false. And in their mouths was found no deceit, for they were without fault. They were without fault, they were blameless. Blameless. Why? Because they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Not because they were perfect, but they were covered in His blood. Praise God. Yes. So in contrast to the worshipers of the beast, this is the people of God and who they were. Their thoughts and their actions are of the Lamb, not the beast. Remember, there's only two groups. These verses, 1 through 5, are here <coughs> to encourage you. They're here to encourage you. We've, we've just went through chapter 12 and 13 where it's talking about all kinds of craziness going on and here he just takes a minute and says, hang on just a minute, let me just encourage you. This is who I called you to be. This is how you're supposed to live your life. Let me encourage you. Let, let me say you can do this. Uh-huh. To remind us of who we are. God is with us and in him we are blameless. These words are to encourage you. So, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Let's move on from the contrast to the crowd. It gets rough. But we're going to move through it. Specifically, three cries from three angels, three things about hell. The rest of chapter 14 really is pretty horrific. Have you read it? It gets pretty rough. It depicts the judgment on the beast and those who follow the beast. The first thing that I want us to see regarding this portion is this. Only a humble response to the gospel will keep us from hell. Mm -hmm. Only a humble response to the gospel will keep us from hell. In verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What is the gospel? It's good news. Uh, the good news that Jesus died for our sins. Listen, he came. You all know the story. Everybody in this room, we're on Wednesday night. You know the story. You know he came. He went to a cross. He died for our sins. I'm just putting it in a nutshell. He died for our sins. He went to hell. When he was in a tomb, he went to hell, took the keys back to what Satan thought he had won. And then he rose again to heaven and he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us and he's coming back. That's, right. That's the gospel. He's coming back and because of that we have hope. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have hope that because he raised from the dead, we will also raise from the dead Amen. if we put our trust in him. Amen. Yes. That's the gospel. That's the gospel this angel is carrying to preach to every tribe, tongue, nation. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Verse 7 is a response. It's a response. Acts chapter 2, Peter presented the gospel. Remember? Remember in Acts 2 when Peter was preaching 
In verse 37 to 38 of, chapter, of Acts chapter 2, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. 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 And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The old is gone and the new come. We must all respond to the gospel. It's the only way out of hell. The second big idea from this portion of text is our world today is evidence of the judgment of hell to come. Our world today is evidence of the judgment of hell to come. Revelation 14, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Another version said it like this, And the second angel came after saying, Destruction has come to Babylon the great, which gave to all the nations the wine of her wrath and her evil ways. Babylon represents the people of the beast. We'll see that the people of God are represented by Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. One day Babylon will fall. The evidence is seen in how evil the NIV says maddening calls it maddening things are now. They drank and they drank and they drank this maddening wine mm -hmm. of the beast Babylon. And things got worse and worse and worse. Jesus. The world would know that. They'd partaken of it, and partaken of it, and partaken of it, and partaken of it. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Mm. That's what it's talking about. In the last part of Romans, chapter 1. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Are you all listening? Mm -hmm. Yes. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, mm -hmm. to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil, mindedness. They're whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boastful, <coughs> inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It's not only that they're doing it, it's that they are celebrating. It's not only that they're doing it, they're trying to convince other people to do it. It's not only that they're doing it, they accept it from everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're not doing it, you're not accepting. It's describing where we live. Yeah. Yeah. It's Babylon. Yeah. There's two groups. There's two groups. 
You either worship the beast or you worship the lamb. Right. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he will give us what we want. He will give us our will. Amen. That's exactly what he's talking about in verse 8. That's exactly what he's talking about. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And someday he's going to say, it's enough. Mm -hmm. This is over. The more that I decide that I don't want him, things will get more and more maddening. Listen, there's no hope. There's no way to Christ without him drawing me to him. So when I when Christ is removed from the picture, it just gets worse. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Come on. When we see this happening, it's just evidence of the wrath of hell to come. God will hand us over. He'll say, take what you want. Understanding that removing God from our lives will bring this fruit in our life. Is it all bad in our world? No, it's not all bad. It's not all bad in the world we live in. It's not. That's right. No. It is clear. We see good. We see good. There's good. He's doing good things. Amen. There's still good things going on around us. It's not all bad. Amen. There is still two sides. Yes, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Come on, we can still worship the Lamb. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The good we see is evidence of God's awesome grace. It's also evidence that we've been created in his image. Come on. The evil we see is evidence of man's depravity. What does your world look most like? Verse 4 or verse 8? The third big idea, third of three, that I'm going to talk about in this portion. Hell is a place where God's passive wrath turns active. Hell is a place where God's passive wrath turns active. Verses 9 through 11. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they shall have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Listen, there's not coming a day that someone goes to hell and is punished and it's over. That day's not coming. It's continual. They'll sin and be punished and sin and be punished and sin and be punished and sin and be punished to never end. Hell like the cross, is just justice worked out. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the cry of the martyrs. Revelation 6, verse 10, and they cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And Jesus said this, Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Come on. Thank you, Lord. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He also said this in Revelation 2, verse 10, 
Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. But faithful unto death, I'll be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. God is sovereign over life and death. Hell is the depiction of what it looks like when God is fully removed. Verses 9 to 13 is a call. A call to faithful endurance. Faithful endurance. A call for endurance. Be faithful, stand the test, persevere to the end. He's saying, I'm calling you, I'm telling you right now, stay faithful. Come on. Good. So far we've seen a contrast in verses 1 through 5. We've seen three cries and a call, and we're going to see that this text ends with certainty. We're going to talk about certainty, and then we're going to close. There are two things that are spoken of in verses 14 through 20. One is a harvest of wheat. And one is a harvest of grapes. The certainty that comes in the midst of both is this fact. All harvests reach a time of reaping. It. All harvests come to a time of reaping. It. A harvest is coming when mankind will be ripe. That's the point of verses 14 through 20. When that time comes, God will separate the wheat from the tares, as Jesus speaks of. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, says another parable. He put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner, the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you want us to sow good seed in your field? Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. Are you listening? The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with, it, with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Listen, and at that time, the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. That's the first image. The second is the image of a vineyard. When grapes are ripe, they're taken out and they're trodden on to separate the juice from the whole grape. That's the process of getting wine. In this analogy, the worker is God. And the grapes are people. Throughout Scripture, the people of God are often depicted as a vineyard. Israel is often referred to as a vineyard. Here, there's a vineyard and a reaping taking place. Now listen, you, are, you and I aren't actual wheat and tares. We understand that. However, there is a time coming that the people of the beast and the people of God will be separated forever. And you and I aren't literal grapes. But there's a time coming where God will take those who have rejected him to an eternal judgment and wrath. They'll be trampled in a wine press. It's a tough text. But you know what's great about this text? What, preacher? It ends with a sweet picture of grace. Where's the grace? Revelation 14, 20, and the wine press was trampled outside the city. 
interesting movie mm -hmm. where he suffered. Outside the city. Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you see where the grapes were taken? Where the wine press was? Outside the city. Don't miss it. Don't miss this because it's the depiction of his grace. John 19, 16 and 17. Then they took Jesus and led him away and he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, God. Jesus went outside the city, outside of Jerusalem, to be crushed. Hebrews 13, 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Matthew 22, 33 and through 42, I'll doubt down and say with me. Hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when the vineyard when vintage time sorry. Now when vintage time drew near, they sent his servants to be the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. When the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another, and sent other servants, more than the first, and did likewise to them. Then last he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Here's the grace. Jesus was trodden for us. Like a wheat, he was cut off for us. Like a tear, sorry. Like a tear, he was cut off for us. He was taken outside the city of Jerusalem so that we could become the new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Jesus wants you in the city. I want to say it again. Jesus wants you in the city. Outside the city, those suburbs, listen, is demon possessed. O outside the city, is ruled by the beast. He wants you in the city. Mm. Jesus wants you in the city. He was taken out. He was trampled on so that you could stay. The question is, are you? Are you staying? Are you grounded? Are you solid? Are you in? Are you in the city? Mm. Revelation 14 is real. It's certain. And it's horrific. But it doesn't have to be our reality. The bad of this chapter is what makes the good so good. Jesus was cut off for us. He was crushed and poured out for us. It's the picture of communion. Mm -hmm. If I had more time tonight, we would have taken communion right here. It's the picture of communion. He took the cup, grape juice, and said, This is the covenant of my blood poured out for you. Outside the city. This is the grace, remember. And it's so good. Listen, if we don't see how hard and sobering and real this chapter is, we don't really get to Jesus. 
right here in me? Not in his wholeness. You can get to him as a good teacher. You can get to him as a nice guy. Mm -hmm. You might even get to him as an example setter. But you won't get to him as Savior. You won't get to him as sacrifice. You won't get to him as slain. And if you don't get to him in those areas, then you really don't get him. Mm -hmm. He was sacrificed. And slain. So we can live. There's people around us. You know who they are. I know who they are. And we're living in Babylon. We're living in Babylon. But if you could have a minute with them, in reality, they'd say it's getting worse and worse and worse. But they're stuck. And he wants to use us. Listen, they're worth it. Yes. They're worth it. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a messed up heart for the lost, you get one. Yeah. If you don't have a cry for the lost, you get one. Mm-hmm. It's time. Church, I just read that story and it reminded me so much of the world that we live in today. Yeah. Right. Not that's coming. I mean, it's here. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And I know if you called it today and said, okay, you can have what you want. <coughs> there are people that I should have told. There are people that I should have loved. That I'm going to be there. It's the reality of this chapter. The reality of this chapter is hell. It's a real place. Jesus, give us compassion. God, give us compassion for the lost. Father, give us compassion for those who are living in Babylon, who are lost, caught up in what they think they know. Give us compassion to reach them. Father, help us not grow weary in well-doing. Help us not grow weary in shouting the gospel, the good news, that every tribe, tongue, nation, Help us. God, help us not be comfortable. Help us not be comfortable tonight. Lost in our own little world as people around us are going to hell. Help us. Hear my words, send me. Here I am. Here I am. Send me. In Jesus' name.